Hello everyone, in our series of Talk Flix's Scale interview, today we have with us Dr. Nidhi Bhatnagar, an MBBS MD, Radio Diagnosis. She also holds an international postgraduate degree in musculoskeletal ultrasound from University of Spain and also has been conferred Professor UCAM Spain. Dr. Bhatnagar has more than 20 years of experience as a radiologist. Presently, she is heading the Department of Radiology of a Central Delhi Multi-Speciality Sanjeevan Hospital. She is also attached to Max Hospital Panchil as a specialist consultant musculoskeletal ultrasound. She is a pioneering figure in popularizing the musculoskeletal ultrasound technique among physicians, especially in hip and knee evaluation. Her areas of expertise include interventional radiology, gynecological and obstetric USG, pediatric radiology, TRUS guided prosthetic biopsies and many more. Dr. Bhatnagar, radiology is a vast, vast field and it for, it's relevant for almost all these specialities in medicine. So do you think radiologists should be qualified in a particular therapeutic area or they should be versatile and uh, should cover all the areas of medicine? Mm, yes, it actually comes as a surprise that we have not got super specializations in radiology. Um, you, can, you can just pick up any field in medicine, whether it's gastroenterology, whether it's surgical field. We have super specializations, we have MCH, we have DM, but for some unknown reason, we have not at all graduated in radiology to super specializations. And I do frankly believe with the kind of uh, the knowledge boom and technological boom, which probably radiology has seen far more than any other specialty, we really need to have some super specialization in place for the um, best results to come through in patient care. So one of your expertise lies in radiological evaluation of the pediatric patients. So what are the considerations in a radiological evaluation of pediatric patients, especially in emergency room? And that's such a nice question. That is really a beautiful question because up until now, um, all the evaluations, let's say, you know, take a scene like of casualty where the child comes with the parents crying. We don't know what to do. Earlier on, we used to have x-rays and we used to have CT scans, which are all um, radiation dependent modalities. We are trying to bring as less possible of radiation as possible. An MRI today for a pediatric patient is like a, a total disaster because the child gets so claustrophobic and scared. So I do believe that ultrasound as a modality where a quick scan, it's easy to do, it's bedside. Uh, the baby can be in the lap of the patients, of, uh, of, the, of the mother and of the parents. And I do believe that um, ultrasound is probably the best modality of choice today for a pediatric patient's quick survey. And then, of course, you can go on to the specialized um, cross-sectional modalities to uh, find out what exactly could be the cause if ultrasound doesn't give you one. So what are some of the therapeutic applications of radiology and besides uh, diagnostic application, you've worked with ultrasound aided treatment. So if you can just shed some light on it. Yeah, I think I think we are quite well aware, um, not only as medical practitioners, but as a general public awareness that ultrasound today is the modality of choice, the first step modality when it comes to the diagnostic procedures. But therapeutics is something which we are now walking into and we've become extremely good at it. We have the aspirations, we can do fluid aspirations and we can do ultrasound guided biopsies, we can do ultrasound guided steroid injections for pain relief or maybe uh, we are talking in terms of vascular access. Nowadays for dialysis we have vascular access which can be done through ultrasounds, angioplasties, catheter placements, uh, most importantly foreign body removals. We do under ultrasound guided, we, we actually diagnose and we find out where the foreign body is and we can do the removal of that foreign body. Th these are just some of the uh, therapeutics where ultrasound works wonders. So musculoskeletal USG is nowadays referred to as mini MRI. So what are the intric intricacies involved with musculoskeletal ultrasound techniques and can these techniques replace uh, other techniques like MRI and CT? That, that's such a sweet way of referring to musculoskeletal ultrasound as a mini MRI. I think it's, it's, um, it's a term which is getting extremely popular. 
but I don't totally agree with it. It's almost like saying that a child is a small adult. When it comes to medicine, everything is an absolute and it is complementary to each other. No musculoskeletal ultrasound can be a mini MRI as much as an MRI or a CD scan replace ultrasound. They are complementary cross-sectional modalities. They get together to help give us a diagnosis. And when it comes to musculoskeletal ultrasound, it's a relatively new concept. And uh, more and more people, more and more consultants or the related specialities, which are like orthopedics and rheumatologists and pain management, um, they are getting into it. And we as radiologists, I think we are carrying that flag uh, to make musculoskeletal ultrasound popular amongst the clinicians. But I do, I, I do believe that um, it, it will take some time. It will take some time because we don't have enough, um, not only the students, but we don't have enough people to teach musculoskeletal ultrasound and that is what our society, that musculoskeletal ultrasound society is doing. Uh, we are ushering every alternate year international conferences. We are bringing the best um, faculty from abroad to teach our radiologists the, the way it should be learned. And the learning curve is a little steep here. It's not like any random regular ultrasound of the abdomen or even ultrasound of the fetus, but I'm very sure that very soon we'll be there and musculoskeletal ultrasound is, I don't know how far it will be true that it will be called the mini MRI. It almost means as if, you know, we'll do away with MRIs, but no, that will not happen. Just as much as we as you know, we've seen the advent of MRIs and we've seen CTs, we've seen ultrasounds, but none of them have been able to replace x-rays. They still exist and they have their own importance. I think in that manner, uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound will also find its place very soon. So there is a strong dismay among radiologists regarding the PCP and DT Act. So, <laughs> so what do you think are the factors or aspects of this law which has resulted in this disappointment and does this law need any revision? I know, I know you brought this up because I'm a radiologist and you're now putting me in a spot. But uh, I have been, I have been uh, like for a very long time associated with PCP and DT. Yes, there is a lot of dissent and a lot of um, dissatisfaction amongst radiologists because you must understand, okay, um, this is kind of a medical social catastrophe. It has a very strong social um, root and probably medical fraternity at some time or the other went that way. It's a chain. Each link has its own importance. So there is a patient and then there is a gynecologist and there is a radiologist and there is a hospital provider. But what happened through the entire system was that the radiologist paid the highest price. Rest of the links sort of got ignored or were not held as importantly in this catastrophe which we call as the female fetus side. It's a good act. Um, it has clarifications, but there are certain gray areas. Those gray areas in these 20 over 20 years have not come to any clarifications. And we do need those gray areas to disappear in order to strengthen this act. The more this act will be strengthened because of those non-gray areas, the more there will be a compliance. I mean, for heaven's sake, you, you cannot give the same punishment to a person who's doing a gender determination, caught red-handed, and to a person who is just kind of found with incomplete paperwork. That is the biggest gray area today. And we need to address that. And I do believe that once we address that, there will be more of compliance from everybody and we'll get better sex ratio results. Dr. Nidhi, you have been working towards attracting medical tourists in India. So... How do you think the government policies has helped you in doing so? That's a great question. Um, yes, I have been associated with medical tourism. There are a few things that I think government can help in a great way. I think first is that we must have a single window, some sort of an online approach where we can address and bring the entire platform so that there is an ease of movement of the patient from one country to another. 
There should be multiple entry visas when the patient is coming for, um, for a medical treatment in India. But most importantly, I think where government needs to step in is that we as medical people will assure the medical um, treatment and the safety of the patient. But when it comes to the personal safety of each patient who is visiting India, I think we need to create a very strong movement there so that patients are not worried by knowing what is happening at a social front in India. They are attracted not only because of the diversity of India they want to visit, but of course they feel safe here. So that is something which is a very big need today for medical tourism. So how do you think an online platform of doctors like Docplexus can help in spreading clinical message among fellow physicians? Okay. This is not because you're sitting here and taking my interview. I have been personally benefited because of Docplexus. I think Docplexus has done an exemplary work and you've created such high standards that me as a person, my society as an association and my ventures, my conferences, my meetings that were international, Docplexus stepped in like a great support. Its network is enormous. People from medical community have come to place a lot of faith in Docplexus because of the integrity and the honesty with which everything is put on that portal. The only way that I feel uh, Docplexus could do a little better will be where you could bring in international associations on the same platform. We are here right now as individuals me as XYZ and somebody else as ABC. But if you bring the associations, today it's globalization. The world is really shrinking. And I think if you bring the international associations together on one platform, it will be great for medical profession. Thank you, Dr. Nidhi, for your kind words and sharing your valuable time with us. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Really good to have you here. Thank you, ma'am. To stay updated on our latest scale videos and interviews, please follow us on Twitter, like us on our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Happy Dogplexing!